For millennia, human beings have been writing antagonists for their heroes to stand against. Just as the hero embodies the pinnacle of virtue and righteousness, so their villain had to encapsulate the essence of evil and sin. However, as cultures evolved and heroes and villains came to clash over and over again, new dynamics began to form between the protagonists and antagonists that helped the classic narrative evolve. Villains grew into a spectrum of demons, gods, mortals, monsters, and madmen. Villains became as likely to be a charming prince as they were to be a deadly dragon. However, the through line remained, a thread that connected many of the greatest villains throughout time. So our question today is, what makes a great villain? A villain needs to bring up some basic questions to the audience before anything else. Namely, how will our hero win? What could halt this unstoppable force? A villain should be a threat before anything else. Having a villain that inspires no dread or fear gives the audience no sense of stakes. Whatever schemes the villain sets out to do, he needs to be able to accomplish it effectively. One of the best examples of this is the Akatsuki from the Naruto and Naruto Shippuden franchise. The Akatsuki are a master class in introducing villains and establishing them as a threat. I can't speak enough praises about how Kishimoto instantly sets up the Akatsuki as a legitimate threat and proceeds to make every one of its members appear devastating to the heroes without making the others appear weak or inconsequential. Each member of the Akatsuki is introduced on a team where one member has an intimate connection with the plot or setting. Spoilers ahead. Itachi arrives as the destroyer of one of the Leaf Village's most prominent clans and the target of revenge for Naruto's best friend. Sasori comes to the Sand Village as the greatest of their puppet masters and the killer of their strongest leader. Kakazu shows up in the story as a headhunter, planning to kill one of the Leaf Village's strongest ninja. Pain reveals himself to be the main character's sibling disciple, who trained under his master over a decade ago. Each one of these is established with a fight or a feat demonstrating their power. Itachi takes down Kakashi, Kisame defeats Killer B, Sasori beats Konkuro, Deidara captures Gara, Hidan and Kakazu kill Asuma and a number of powerful enemies, and Pain kills Jiraiya. Each of these fights is set up to establish the villain's strength against a well-established protagonist. This way the audience is able to recognize the situation their hero is in, taking on these bad guys. Think about other films and shows that use this trick. Tai Lung takes down the Furious Five and Shifu before he fights Po. Everyone in Dragon Ball Z beats up Vegeta before they fight Goku. It's classic setup to have an auxiliary protagonist fall to a villain as an easy way to establish the stakes in taking on this bad guy. But there are other ways to accomplish this. For instance, having a villain control a large organization or a powerful weapon is another way to establish a threat. The Bond villains do this all the time. A powerful organization works in the shadow, Bond sneaks in and discovers their leader. The writer doesn't have to establish the villain's power because we already know how strong the organization and its members are. Comics often use this form of team-ups, where a brainy villain, who may not be physically powerful, is able to orchestrate a team of established bad guys to do their bidding. Lex Luthor, Vandal Savage, Doc Ock, and Gorilla Grodd have taken this position. This relies on the other villains already being established as threats to the hero on their own. A last way I'll list here to establish a villain's strength is prophecy. An ancient text or wise prophet speaks of the return of a great evil. One of the most prominent characters in recent gaming to use this is Ganondorf. Though he takes many names, the Dark Wizard is always hyped up by his name being whispered from the darkest corners of Hyrule. However, it's not just enough to have the prophecy say the villain is powerful. Rather, there needs to be some physical signs or aftermath of what the great returning villain did in the past. The most recent installment in the Zelda series, Breath of the Wild, does this extremely well by having the hero battle through the ruins of a kingdom Ganon's already destroyed. This makes the fact that he's returning all the more pressing because the player has a palpable sense of his power.
man turned to the darker methods. What pushes a person just like you or I to turn to villainy? The reason why the villain needs a compelling reason to perform their actions is that the bad guy needs to be relatable. The hardest part is not giving the reason for the villain's return, but making that reason reach the audience on an emotional level. Take this scene from The Lion King. Well, I was first in line until the little hairball was born. That hairball is my son and your future king. Oh, I shall practice my curtsy. Don't turn your back on me, Scar. Oh, no, Mufasa. Perhaps you shouldn't turn your back on me. <laughs> is that a challenge? Temper, temper. I wouldn't dream of challenging you. Pity. Why not? Well, as far as brains go, I got the lion's share, but when it comes to brute strength... I'm afraid I'm at the shallow end of the gene pool. <sighs> There's one in every family, sir. Two in mine, actually. And they always manage to ruin special occasions. <sighs> what am I going to do with him? He'd make a very handsome throw rug. Sazu! And just think... Whenever he gets dirty, you can take him out and beat him. Notice the surface level motivation is that Scar won't be king. But once the conversation begins, we see the mention of their brotherhood, genetics, and familial relationship. This is the tale of a younger brother being put down by his superior sibling. The scene ends with a line that sums it up. What are we going to do with him? Mufasa asks. And then they proceed to make fun of the idea of killing Scar, skinning him, and making him into a throw rug. Now, while this is obviously in jest, it shows how Mufasa's way of speaking about his brother would have affected him his whole life. There's also the fact that Scar has the name Scar, and bears a mark of a creature maimed in battle. All of this contributes to the subtext that Scar has been beaten down in life, and that his name is probably a cruel reminder of his inescapable position beneath his spotless brother's heel. Think about this as compared to Clayton from Disney's Tarzan. I mean, all people understand a desire for money, but we never see that Clayton came up in a poor background or struggled without money. He's just a jerk that wants to get rich. Not that he's a bad villain, but he's not great, even though his motivation is clearly defined and relatable. We as the audience don't truly connect with him in our guts. This can take any form. Even the most extreme villains can be made relatable to the audience. Think about Scar from the Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood series, ironically sharing the same name as our previous example. He's introduced as a hyper-religious murderer who's crusading to kill the protagonist for a crime the hero had nothing to do with. He starts off the show murdering a little girl and her dog, their dad, and a group of aging military men. Great guy, right? He just shows up as a murder hobo clad in religion as a glorified hypocrite. And he's called a hypocrite by both the agnostic main character of the show and his own religious teachers. However, when we dive below the surface, we meet a man whose life was destroyed by alchemy the main character in his nation used to commit genocide on Scar's people. A person who's beaten and broken with no home and no family to return to. All in one day, his life was completely destroyed and he became an exile. On top of that, he witnessed the horrors of alchemy firsthand and refuses to forgive those people who destroyed his home. But that's the part where he's relatable. He refuses to let go of his hatred. He wants to hold a grudge. So he's not a mindless festering wound of pain and revenge. He's a completely mentally aware and consenting festering wound of pain and revenge. In short, he doesn't want to let go. That one distinction makes him relatable to anyone who's ever been mistreated and harbored hatred. He's an avatar of human emotion. This makes his fight tragic, because we as an audience can understand how much easier it is to let hate fester than to let go and forgive, even when that hate is destroying us. This makes Scar's eventual turn to the side of good and his subsequent battle with the literal embodiment of wrath so satisfying. His conflict is with his own deadly sin of hatred, personified in his final bout in the show. He's not fighting a war general, he's fighting what we all battle, ourselves. Another important note to remember is to heavily ground these motivations in something substantive. This must be the most airtight part of your plot. 
A show to get a great idea of what I'm talking about, oddly enough, is the How It Should Have Ended series from Hish. They have a wonderful library of villains stopping to think about their motivations for a moment, and then completely destroying the plot of the film. If your villain's plot isn't put together, then your audience will be thinking the whole time, gosh, that really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I can't tell you how many times I see a film that destroys a potentially great villain because they make a leap of logic I just can't follow. Like, my wife might die in a vague dream I have, so I'm gonna kill my colleagues, join a madman, and murder children. This does not a compelling villain make. Now, I want to make one small note here. The magnitude of the tragedy or event does not determine how much it will affect a person. Let me explain. Each character will take loss differently, so the death of a sibling may mean a lot to a person, or a little, depending on their relationship. Let's take the two Scars again. Scar the Lion doesn't seem to be too broken up about losing Mufasa, but I'm sure the other Scar would have a few words for him about his brother. Both have very well-established relationships with their siblings. One would kill in vengeance for the death of his brother, while the other kind of threw his sibling off a cliff. Establishing a connection that the audience can relate to is important to sell us on the tragedy, and, if it's possible, leave a lasting reminder of this villain's pain with a, a visual symbol of some kind. The lion's scar had his scar from before Mufasa's fall. His visual indicator shows us his pain is from the relationship between he and his older brother, whereas in Full Metal Alchemist, Scar receives his scar and his arm transplant when his brother dies his brother transmuting his own arm onto Scar so that he could live. Now Scar is carrying around a memento of his brother with him at his side literally every day. A similar setup is done with Zuko's burned face, Sasuke's slashed headband, or Darth Vader's breathing apparatus. Well, that wraps up part one of my Write Better Villains discussion. Part two will be releasing soon. I'm John Malasa and that's my two cents. Please continue the conversation down below, and if you like this video, please like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell to stay updated with all our videos.